Is gaming dying? Modern games depress me. What went wrong with gaming? Gaming isn't fun anymore? These are all videos you may have seen or at least recommended to you in the past couple of months. All of them paint a certain level of cynicism about the state of the industry. And I do sympathize and agree with a lot of the criticism, but almost all of them suffer from the same problem where they can never step outside of their comfort zone. This isn't going to be a pure disagreement or an agreement, but rather my own observation around the discussion of video games. The points that I often see brought up in the gaming is dying discussion are the following. There's a general lack of polish. Video games are now too political. The aging and nostalgia argument. The technological advancement argument. The monetization argument. And the information overload argument. I don't believe that these arguments are invalid, but how much I agree with each of these is going to differ. So let's begin with the lack of polish argument. You don't have to go far into the recent past to find 10 AAA games that have released uncomplete, unpolished, and were ultimately big disappointments. The commonly believed reason for this is that with the ability to patch a game online, the incentive to release a game in a playable state has been reduced. The Miyamoto quote, a delayed game is eventually good, but a rushed game is forever bad, no longer really holds any weight due to this. I have to agree that the technical polish for all types of games is worse than it used to be. But where I differ is in the idea that you have to play the newest releases on day one. I can understand wanting to be at the beginning of an online competitive game where everyone is a noob and learning the game together, but when it comes to single player, you can just wait for patches, buy it on sale, and get a superior experience for a cheaper price. The only thing you're missing out on is being part of the online gaming community, and I have to ask, is it really worth it? Do you really need to play this game on day one? We have countless numbers of independent content creators which are going to tell you if it lives up to expectations. I'm not excusing the poor quality, but a bit of self-control and consumer awareness goes a long way to protect yourself from this issue. The next thing I want to discuss is the politicalization argument. This is an argument more broadly associated with modern Western media as a whole where a lot of people complain about politics being inescapable. Instead of the story primarily being written to entertain you, it becomes a second class citizen in comparison to the political narrative that the writers want to push. Now the common disagreement to this is that art has always been political. Metal Gear Solid 2 is often pointed to as being obviously political, but I feel like the primary complaint is that the political intent has never been so blunt. If we are talking about comedy, then yeah, most comedians are absolutely politics first, comedy second. The amount of cheering and wooing compared to laughter makes this very apparent. If we talk about film, then there are definitely examples where it is so obvious that the writers have an agenda. But for video games, I mostly disagree. Like yeah, it's a little less subtle than it used to be, but it still feels like we're making mountains out of anthills. I mostly just see more inclusiveness. There are more gay characters, there are more characters that aren't white or Japanese, women are less eye candy. Is this always done tastefully? No, but it's pretty ignorable in the grand scheme of things and seems to only be a big deal for those specifically looking for it. The culture surrounding games definitely feels more political, but the games themselves, not really. Next is the aging and nostalgia argument. This is an argument often used against the games and now bad narratives. The main premise of this argument is that we either misremember how good games are, or that our standards as kids were a lot lower because we had yet to have anything to compare to. I agree with the idea that as we get older, our standards increase and our tastes get more defined. The video that really sold me on this idea was when some Zoomer started to talk about his good old days about video games and was talking about a bunch of AAA sequels of games that were coming out to the early to mid 2010s. To this person, Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag was the good old days. The reality is that kids have more fun. I myself am not immune to it. I actually enjoyed Bubsy on the Super Nintendo. It was not as good as Super Mario or Donkey Kong Country 3, but it was still decent. The internet disagrees however, and many people have made videos dunking on it for being a terrible game. And while I still think it's a bit overhated, it's definitely a game I don't want to go back and replay. 
Perhaps the only reason I remember it well is because I could return to the start of a stage with a cheat code so I didn't have to worry about the brain damage kid at my after school care from deleting the save spile me and other kids spent months on. We were four stages away from beating Donkey Kong Country free. But now we get to nostalgia, and being an independent adult, I get to buy, or emulate, all the games I didn't get to play but thought looked really cool, and as it turns out, a lot of those games have held up really well. But at the same time, there's a lot of games that have been completely outclassed with the passage of time. With that said though, the games I remember really enjoying were still really fun, if not just as good as I remember them being, with only a couple of exceptions like GoldenEye 64 a game that is notorious for aging poorly. And then we have World of Warcraft, an ever-evolving game that changed before I was ready for it to change. But in 2012, I realized I could play the original version of WoW on a poorly reverse-engineered private server with 350 ping. Yay, Australia! I logged in, I played, and I just explored. It was a magical experience. And then I logged in the next day to see my character gone due to the server having a 16 hour rollback. These servers sucked. They were often corrupt, they lagged and crashed all the time, most quests which required scripting were broken, the pathfinding often forgot to use the Y axis, but I was having fun. When we finally got a good server with Nostarius, I was in bliss. Nostarius remains my favourite gaming experience of my lifetime. So the point of this is to say that I think that the nostalgia argument is mostly bullshit, but I will still agree that our standards have increased over time. The technological advancement argument is that games are getting less fun because the technological advancement is no longer able to drive innovation. You think about how much gaming changed between 1992 and 2002. 2002 to 2012. And then you sort of realize that the games that came out in 2012 aren't exactly that different in scope to the games that come out today. So I'm pretty on board with the technological advancement argument. I will point out that VR technology is cool if you give it a try, and there are still amazing games like Teardown which I need to buy a new processor for. But as a whole, it doesn't seem like games are radically different in scope compared to 10 years ago. And I want to mention the keyword scope. Because innovation is still happening, it's just not through sheer technological advancement. Most of this is being done in the indie scene and with publishers like Devolver Digital. There are so many games out there exploring what games could be. But a lot of the people who make these gaming is dying videos rarely even play these games. They don't take risks with their preferences as they just stick with the same stagnant AAA rehash over and over again. How can games be innovative if you're not willing to try and innovate your own preferences? Are the majority of indie games bad? Yes, but that doesn't matter when you have thousands of different content creators willing to do the gem picking for you. Just find someone that likes playing the games that you like, see what their top X games of the year are, and see if anything interests you. If you see something that could be cool, wishlist it and buy it for 50 to 75% off when the sale comes around. Don't like it? Steam refund policy is extremely generous. The primary cause of lack of innovation in the AAA sphere is because they are financially rewarded for being stagnant. But speaking of finance, let's talk about the monetization argument. The big complaint I hear is that you used to just buy games and you had the game. Maybe you could buy an expansion or two, but those expansions often felt like new games, so most people were pretty happy with this system. But then Todd Howard decided to add purchasable horse armor, and now when you buy a game, you don't actually own the entire game. Is the horse armor actually a deal breaker? No, it's not, and especially in a single player game, it doesn't really impact your experience. But I don't blame people for being angry about it. I paid $60. Why am I not getting the full experience? Well, the reason is that the horse armor made Bethesda millions of dollars at the cost of maybe two people buying future Bethesda games. I do not blame people for being angry about companies trying to double dip. I do not blame people for being scared of the slippery slope. And unfortunately, the slippery slope is no fallacy. It is real. Let's talk about World of Warcraft again. In 2004, originally you just had to pay for the game and the subscription. 2006, Blizzard added their first paid character service that let you move your character from one server to another. 
More services were added later. 2006 again. The Warcraft TCG comes out and some of the physical cards have redeemable codes for unique in-game items that can only be obtained through the trading card game. Those items can be sold on the auction house for gold. 2007, the first expansion comes out. It costs money. 2010, the Celestial Steed gets released at WoW's first of many cosmetic microtransactions. 2013, you can now purchase a level boost to make your character max level. 2015, you can now purchase gold by selling premium game time to other players. So we went from paying a box price and a subscription to also having to pay for expansions. That's already triple dipping, but MMOs are expensive to make and it's pretty tolerable. What's not tolerable is that in return, we get a game where the coolest looking items, the most unique items and in-game advantages can be bought with real money. Is this something that happens with most games? No. As far as I know, World of Warcraft is the only game that octuple dips. But I use it as an example how games can absolutely get worse if the community still plays the product. I do, however, want to look at the bright side and talk about the monetization improvements. Number one, for games which still go off the box price models, things have never been cheaper. $60 USD in 2023 was worth $76 in 2013 and $97 in 2003. Number two, it's really easy to just wishlist games and buy them when they are 50 to 90% off. And number three, the free to play model has removed the barrier to entry for a lot of big multiplayer games and a lot of the time the monetization is actually pretty good. Fortnite to me is the gold standard. It has a cheap battle pass, it has some optional cosmetics, and unless you're afraid of some 10 year old mocking you for being a no skin, you're not going to be paying a single cent. As an Australian who has not been able to enjoy certain games due to a lack of players in my geographical location, the ease of access does make a big difference to me. There are absolutely egregious examples of games that could have been fun but ended up being total exploitation fests. But being upset about these games after playing them is a lot like going into a gay bar and then complaining about being hit on by dudes. Overall, I do think that the monetization argument holds weight and this has negatively impacted games that I do like. But for most AAA titles, I view this more as a growing threat rather than an all-encompassing reality. Fortunately, there's plenty good AA and indie games which don't have this problem. It's almost like none of this matters if you just ignore AAA and mobile. And now, finally, we get to the information overload argument. This is the one I struggle with the most, as it has completely changed how online gaming is played. What is meant by information overload is that there is just a huge amount of information about most games on the internet. With single player games, it doesn't really matter, as there isn't any real external pressure to spoil the game for yourself. You can just ignore the community, play the game blind, and have a good time. With online multiplayer games, however, you are at a massive disadvantage if you do not consume online content to learn about your favorite game. Take Overwatch for example. Once a competitive mode has been established, it doesn't take long for a meta to be created. Normally in the past, this meta took a long time to be established as most people were blissfully ignorant and just played the game for fun. But with information so accessible, it went from something you could optionally do to something where if you didn't know what the meta was, you were actively called out and raged at by your teammates. Stuff like this has always been inevitable, but it typically just took a very long time to occur. The internet has just accelerated the inevitable. That's why despite a game's launch often being the worst state of the game, the meta surrounding the game is at its best because nobody knows what the best way to play the game is and people are actually open-minded. Unless of course there's already been an open beta and then prior to launch everyone knows what the best builds are and that process of discovery has already been taken away from you. You can ignore it, but it comes with a great cost of other players not wanting to play with you. This is a trickle down effect and it's mostly unavoidable. It's a big part of the reason why after Nastarius, I just got bored of Classic WoW. The original game was poorly documented and it changed before it could be properly documented. After Nastarius, you had a bunch of people making content for the game and explaining every single little system you needed to learn if you wanted to play the game at maximum efficiency. It felt like I went from a game where most people were noobs and through strife you would make friends, 
to a game where everyone knew what they were doing so once you completed your objective, people left immediately for the next objective. For an online game, the meta is the game. And unfortunately, the best way of playing World of Warcraft beyond that point was not a fun way of playing World of Warcraft. There are online games which are trying to adjust for this meta stagnation. League of Legends and Fortnite have frequent updates that try and shake everything up to avoid meta stagnation, but it's ultimately a fight against the inevitable, and this is something we're just going to have to live with. Yes, you can play in your own special way, but I and most people play online games to play with other people. And if the best way to play with other people isn't fun, then the game isn't fun. Conclusions The landscape of video games is changing. I think that most people can agree that good AAA games are less common and that the experimental phase of most online games is getting shorter. But when you have such a rich archive of good indie, AA and older games that regularly go on sale, why focus so much on the bad when there is more good in this industry than ever before? And this is my main issue. The people who complain about the state of video games rarely ever step outside their comfort zone. Yes, it's sad that your favourite franchise is bad now. But what's sadder is that you loyally stick with a franchise that continually underdelivers while you paint the same industry in the same shit-stained brush despite having more good options than ever before. If you want to actually improve your perception of gaming, start creating a backlog. Whenever you get tired of modern AAA, play a game from that backlog. Perhaps you want to play something relatively new. Find one of the many thousand YouTube channels covering indie games. Just go through their top games of the year if you want a short way to discover games that you may have missed. Are AAA games in a bad state? Yes. Is the rest of the core gaming industry in a bad state? Absolutely not. It's never been better. If you want to improve the industry, the best thing you can do is play the games made by the people trying to make it better. If you wanted to do more, maybe you could be the curator that finds the gems among the rough. And if you're crazy enough, maybe you could try and make your own games. If you're interested in that and have a vague idea of how programming works, check out my How to Make a Vampire Survivor's Clone in Godot 4 tutorial series. The engine is completely free, the tutorial is completely free, it's beginner friendly, and you're actually left with a fun game at the end of it. So if you're interested, check it out in the link below. Bye.